Uh, good morning. My name is Carl Monger. I'm the executive director of Gallant Few. And uh, because a lot of you have seen me talk already or you've watched the video, I'm not going to go through who I am. But when we have the breakout part, if you guys want to ask me questions about that, I don't know why you'd want to, but if you do, you're welcome to do so. So, um, all right, let's see if we're going to work. Um, this is, you can get to see it big because when I talk to small groups, I pass this around. This is the compass that my great uncle Roy Jones carried as a squad leader in World War I in France. And he told me some awesome stories about going over the top, going through no man's land, sending patrols out. One kind of funny story, it's kind of sad, but he was angry he lost his uh, 45 because he sent a patrol out and the dummy that was leading the patrol got killed and left in, in his body and the 45 were left down there. So he was kind of bummed out about that. But what's really interesting about this is nobody in the family ever heard any of his stories. He never talked to anybody about that stuff until I came back from the military and I was a veteran. And now we're, you know, how many war generations apart? And I'm not really a combat veteran. I, I got credit for a combat deployment in Desert Storm, but never shot at anybody, never got shot at. You know, just did, uh, did everything that I could to get there, but it didn't happen. Uh, but he felt all of a sudden we're at a family gathering, he felt like he could just open up and talk. And he started telling me about his experiences. And the next day, really treasure that time too, but the next day I'm talking to my grandmother. Everybody else had left. She's washing a plate or something, and, I, and it's her brother. And I said, well, what do you think about when, when Roy uh, was under artillery fire and he crawled over and pulled his buddy over into his foxhole with him? And she about dropped the plate. And she told me, what? I want to hear about this. He had never told anybody else in the family any of those stories. But now I was a safe person for him to talk to, so he felt like he could share with me. Uh, it, that was one of the first lessons about the value, cross-generational, of veterans that connect with each other and really share. So imagine doing land navigation with that old compass, and now we got, actually this now to you young guys and gals, is like that compass I showed you that Roy used, right? Because now it's all electronic, you got GPS, you know, to within one foot anywhere in the world where you are. Well, back in my day, we had to rely on this. And how many of you have done night land navigation? Okay, a lot of people have. So for those of you that don't know, when you're doing night land navigation, that's kind of what it looks like. Especially if you're going in the forest, right? That's kind of what it looks like. And I don't know if you can tell or not, but that next picture has the compass in it glowing very, very faintly. And that's what you're trying to follow to get through that dark forest, right? So you don't realize it, but that's what you're getting ready to walk into. But it's night, so you can't see it. So as you're following that compass and you're following that azimuth, what happens when you hit that? There's no way you can walk on a straight line following that glow in the dark line on the compass, right? You got to go left, you got to go right, you're going to fall down, you got to figure out how do I get back on that azimuth. So now that's really what it looks like, right? Because you don't have your flashlight on. And then what happens? You walk into something in the middle of the night, right? Holy crap, just walk through a spider web. What happens? You do the spider dance, trying to get it off of you. And because you have no idea where that white glowing thing is, if it landed on you or not, now what? You're off azimuth again, right? You gotta figure out how to get back on. So now you're back in the dark forest again, then what happens? Hmm, what am I gonna do here? You're gonna have to figure out a way to get around that, right? I mean, you guys get the point, right? As you go along, eventually you're so lost, it's hopeless. <laughs> Military transition is similar to this. In real life, as you go through your transition, the things that take you off azimuth are waiting in line at the VA, trying to get your benefits approved, it's having relationship issues, it's being over-medicated, it's uh, being the only adult in a classroom in college, and it's drinking to self-medicate. All of these things take you off of that transition azimuth. And the most the, the item that is the most dangerous, the thing that can take you the most off of that azimuth, is isolation. 
And when you come back to a community like Dallas-Fort Worth, I can tell you from personal experience because my, my uh, wife works for a Textron company and at the time Bell Helicopter, we were living in Wichita, Kansas, and she took a job transfer to come here. I have a couple of high school friends that live in the Dallas area, but I don't know them. I haven't talked to them in 30 years. And so when I came here, I didn't know anybody. And because I carry my office right here in my back pocket, and I home office, I don't go report in somewhere. I don't go at eight o'clock in the morning to a bunch of other people and have coffee and talk. Uh, I have to make a concerted physical effort to get myself out and go meet other people in the area. Otherwise, I'm that red person that's standing outside the circle that doesn't know anybody. Because what happens in your neighborhoods at home? Do you know the person that lives across the street from you? You might see them when they mow their yard and wave at them, but do you know their name or where they're from or what they do for a living? No, the nature of society right now is you don't. Could be a veteran that lives right across the street from you and you don't know. So you have to figure out how to get, how do you break outside of that isolation? It's tremendously important. As you go through that transition journey, all of those things that take you off of the azimuth, the, look at that target there. That's, I want to go to college, I want to be a CPA and have my own firm someday. Maybe that's the dream of a veteran. As those things start taking you off azimuth and you're missing that target, the further into time that you go, the harder it is to meet it. So the first slide's like six months. That one takes six months times three or four. The line keeps getting farther apart, right? So the, the longer that you walk on that, that transitional azimuth and you're not on the correct azimuth, the harder it's gonna be, the farther you're gonna be away from your target when you get there. I'm gonna talk about how do you, how do you not do that? So the big three things, as you're off asthma, the big three things that uh, the VA says impact every veteran, unemployment being the first one. Uh, unemployment is not the picture that the Department of Labor presents. With the exception of this last month, post 9-11 veterans, meaning veterans under the age of 35, have an unemployment rate that is about 30% higher than the general population. Okay, so this is, this is one of those, as you're going through your transition, you got you to worry about because that's out there in front of you. 30% higher than the general population. When you look at the Department of Labor stuff, it says veteran unemployment is like non-existent. It's like two and a half, maybe 3%. It's lower than the national average for everybody in America. But post 9-11 veterans are 30% worse. When you look at veterans my era and earlier, Desert Storm and earlier, our unemployment rate is virtually zero. It's less than 2% usually. So we drive the rate way down. You could say veterans that are of my era, we either figured it out or we're dead, right? We either killed ourselves or the VA did or we figured it out and got a job. But the young veterans are having difficulty getting those jobs and keeping those jobs. So that's, that's the first of the big three you gotta watch out for. Homelessness, the VA says they've solved it. I'll tell you that we worked with a veteran a couple of months ago right here in this area, Trophy Club, Texas, my neighborhood. He had a health issue. It ate his savings. He, like most veterans, didn't want to talk about it with anybody. Then he had to move out of his house into an apartment. Then he couldn't pay his apartment. He moved to an extended state place. Then he moved in with his son in an apartment with he and his wife and their three dogs. And things were getting really, really tense. And then his son said, oh, by the way, I just took a new job. I'm moving out of, out of the city. So now this guy's got no place to stay. And he's making money, but not enough to put a deposit on an apartment. So he gets referred to me. And I said, ah, oh, the VA solved unemployment. Go talk to the VA. So he goes to the VA. The VA says, go talk to the Housing and Urban Development Department. He goes to HUD. They say, when are you going to be homeless? And he says, a week from Friday. My son leaves. We're going to be in my car. And they said, well, come back on that day. You can fill out the papers, and then you got a 14-day waiting period, and then we'll get you your, like, how is that solving unemployment? That doesn't make sense to me. Um, suicide, 20 per day. The VA released a study last year. You've heard 18, you've heard 22. Now the VA says it's 20. What's really interesting about the study and should be alarming to all of us is that 65% of those 20 veterans that take their lives on average every day are over the age of 50. You would think, if you ask somebody, how old's a veteran when they commit suicide? Oh, it's somebody just got back from war, they can't deal with what they've been through and they kill themselves. No, it's a process. When you think back to those transition lines, as they go farther and farther apart, that process takes decades to go through. 
And ultimately, you get to a point where you have no purpose, and if you have no purpose, you have no hope. And the reason that I'm going through all of these is because this has affected my family. That tombstone up there is my grandfather on my father's side. I was adopted when I was 12 by my stepdad, who I call my dad. And my last name changed from Vodder to Munger when I was adopted. My grandfather was a World War II Korean Vietnam infantryman. I never met him. He died in 1977 in a men's shelter in Denver, and all his possessions fit in a shoebox. And of the half dozen times that I've seen my biological father in my life, one of the times that I saw him, he told me that he went and picked up his stuff, it all fit in a shoebox, and he said he was an alcoholic. I hated the guy. He threw my dad out of the house when my dad was 16. My dad ultimately retired as a sergeant major in the Army. And like I said, I only met him a half a dozen times in my life. Um, the effects of post-traumatic stress, untreated, alcoholism, traumatic brain injury, the wartime experiences, if they are not corrected or checked or you get somebody to help guide and mentor you through that process, the impact of that is generational. When you look at the funnel that goes out into the future, your kids are going to be affected, their kids are going to be affected, their kids are going to be affected, not to mention the, the other family and friends, right? So it is a huge problem, and it's one that because the traditional approach doesn't work, we as veterans have to take charge of it, and we have to make it work. We have to make something work. Uh, Nick Palmasciano talked about this last year. Nobody owes you anything. One of the things that a lot of veterans have an attitude that I serve my country, so why does that guy get to drive a nicer car than me? Because he didn't serve his country. Nobody owes you anything. You gotta get that into your head right now, right? You volunteered, you knew, especially those post 9-11, which I have utmost respect for anybody that volunteers, especially knowing that we're at war. But you gotta understand, you earned certain benefits from the VA, I'm mean, being cold about it, but nobody owes you anything other than that. So don't go with an expectation that people are gonna give you stuff. We still have to earn our way, and we have to demonstrate every day. Uh, I was talking too much, so that thing flipped by, but what is it? Uh, let me see if I can go back to it real quick here. So what it's going to say is you have responsibility. Uh, I break responsible into two words, response, able. And you may not believe it, but you have the ability to choose your response to any situation that you're in front of, right? So... Uh, some people say, well, I have to take that next drink. You don't have to take the next drink. You can choose not to take that drink. You have to figure out what the tools are. Somebody has to help you with those tools. But there are ways that you can make the choice not to make the next drink. I'm going to tell a real quick story that I heard Dr. Stephen Covey tell. And uh, he's the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and a number of other books. Passed away a few years ago. But a couple of times I got to meet him in person. And what a phenomenal guy. And he told this story, and I don't know if he made it up or not, but I'm going to tell it kind of like it's my story because I think it means more that way. So I like to go every Friday morning into a diner and have a cup of coffee and plan out my week. I want to be able to know where my big meetings are, where my big responsibilities are, and then I can fill in all the other crap after that. But while I'm there, I like to read the paper. I like to work the crossword. It's my time that I get to have just to myself. Look forward to it all the time. Well, on this particular morning... There's this little kid, he's eight or nine years old, he's running around the diner, and he is just raising hell, creating havoc, he's knocking stuff over, spilling things, kicking things, just generally making a huge nuisance of himself. And the dad is sitting in a booth, just kind of staring off into space, like he doesn't care, he's not doing anything about his son, and I'm just getting angrier and angrier and angrier, right? Because I want to string this little kid up because he's impacting on my time. So finally I go, hey, sir, sir, could you do something about your kid, you know, trying to read the paper, have coffee, and can you see your son is disrupting us? And the guy kind of like comes back from outer space and he said, oh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I've uh, been up all night, just came from the hospital where we found out that my wife, his mom, is going to die. And I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> what went through your head when you go from the before story to the after story, right? If you're like me, First, I want to get some duct tape, tie him up, hang him up on a hook somewhere so I can go back to my paper. Now I'm like, come over here and color on my paper. Let your dad work through his stuff. You know, let, let me, did you get breakfast? Let me buy you breakfast. Your, your whole attitude changes. Everything about it changes. But the situation didn't change. What changed was in here and in here. 
you have the ability to force yourself to make that kind of a change, to choose that response to any situation that you're in front of. You have that responsibility. Uh, you got to realize as you go through life, there is no failure. There is only information. And if you don't feel good about yourself, it's hard to process that information. right? So you don't say, I absolutely failed at that. I took another drink. Um, I kicked the dog again. I'm a failure. I'm worthless. I'm a piece of crap. It's information. What happened that caused that to happen? And how can you not do that again in the future? I'm going to get to that in a minute. All right, so how do you stay on azimuth? The first way you do it is you've got to get a guide, right? Because if you don't know what the azimuth is, how are you going to stay on it? Right, a lot of veterans are pinging around through life trying to figure out. Is it for me? <laughs> trying to figure out what they want to do. Uh, I've had veterans that have gone to college because they get money that can pay rent for an apartment because of the GI Bill. But they're just spinning their wheels for four years. they got a place to live for four years, but then when they come out of that, they don't have an education that's going to help them live the rest of their life. So you know, I tell a lot of veterans, when you get out, you don't want to go to school right off the bat because you don't know what you want to do yet. you got to figure that out. you got to get your asthma. The way that you start having that discussion is you have to have a one-on-one -on -one sit down, eyeball to eyeball with somebody that you know and respect. And if you're a veteran that's transitioning and you're not connected, you gotta go find somebody and you gotta get connected to them. And you can do that through Facebook and you can do it through LinkedIn and you can do it by enrolling with Gallant Few, but you gotta find somebody that's the same MOS, the same branch of the service, that is a transitional generation ahead. That's a big word I trip up on sometimes, a transitional generation ahead. Meaning they've been through school, they got their job, they're established in the community, they belong to Rotary Clubs and Chambers of Commerce, and they have golfing buddies, and they go to men's and women's church Bible studies. Whatever they do to associate with other people locally, that's what you got to get them to tell you, how did you go from being a truck driver in the Marine Corps to owning your own business that makes $2 million a year? How, how did you do that? And when you meet somebody like that, now you start to lay out a path that you might be able to do the same thing or they're going to introduce you to somebody that's really going to help you with your interest. So you got to stay on azimuth and you got to get a guide. Uh, Nick talked yesterday about the bowl of bad emotions. What he did is he gave you an AAR. Right? What happens? Anytime you do anything in the military, you have an after action review. Right? List three pluses, three minuses. Let's go through what we did right, what we did wrong, so we don't make that mistake. Same mistakes in the future and we remember to do the right things. When's the last time anybody asked you for your transitional AAR? if you've already transitioned, if you are transitioning or you've been through the ACAP program or whatever your branch of the service calls it, did at any time somebody sit down and say, here is an AAR on transition. These are the things they're doing right out there. These are the things they're doing wrong out there. It's different in every community. It's different in Dallas. It's different in Los Angeles. It's different in New York. But when you sit down one-on-one -on -one with that veteran that's just like you, now it's relevant and it's local. And that veteran has the moral authority, the emotional authority, to challenge. When I sit down with an infantryman or a paratrooper or a ranger, I can challenge that person in ways that I can't challenge a Marine. Right? Marines in here, you guys put an R in the middle of HUA, and the Navy drops off the H. I mean, it's, it's a totally different language. And when I try to challenge a Marine in certain ways, I'm less effective because I'm not a Marine. And that person can look at me and say, you're not a Marine, what do you know? Uh, the, the Navy, I still haven't figured out their ranks. I'll salute like an E2 because... <laughs> One of the things that guide can help you do is understand how to process the chaos. You've gone from order. You know what your next job is going to be. You can timeline out your next promotion. You know what resources are out there. And then you go out to the civilian world and pff, who knows, you know, everything's all mixed up, right? When you sit down with that guide, you can say, I don't understand why the kids in my classroom are, they don't even realize that last week two rangers died in Afghanistan. I spoke to a rotary club uh, on uh, Thursday morning, and I said, how many of you know that last week two rangers died in Afghanistan? And there were two people out of 30 that raised their hand. Like, that's why a veteran comes back and they feel like nobody gives a crap because you don't even know what's going on in the world. That could be one of the most important things that's going on in my life because that's my regiment, and you don't even know what happened. They gave their life for your freedom to have this cup of coffee, and you don't even know they did it. 
you have to be careful about that attitude because that can get you thinking that you're better than a non-veteran, right? So you have to be careful about that. Um, there are a number of ways to, that uh, you can stay on azimuth. And the number one, and what I love about what Nick has done with his vision for this, is it helps you to live with intent. I talked earlier about veterans pinging around, trying to figure out what they want to do. You have to identify what is your objective. A lot of people talk goals and objectives. Well, a goal, if you look in the dictionary, is something that you hope to achieve. An objective is something you plan to achieve. So I try to always say objective and not goal because we want to create a plan. We want to be intentional. And we want to be functionally fit. Uh, yesterday we heard uh, Team Red, White, and Blue talk about functional fitness and, and doing CrossFit. I'm 56 years old in about two weeks. I had a prosthetic hip. I've had back surgery. I ain't doing CrossFit, right? I mean, I'm just not, I'm not doing it. But I can indoor rock climb and I can ride a bike and I can do things that... I have to adjust my lifestyle, I have to be functionally fit to what it is that I want to do. Uh, we don't talk wellness, we talk fitness. We used to talk emotional wellness, which to me means go lay on a couch, so, tell somebody your problem, they're gonna go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, what do you think about that? What do you, how do you feel about that? That's not what we want to do. We want to develop ways to be fit in every area of our life. Those areas that Gallifrey focuses on, if you notice around the ring, around the outside, self-training and response Ability. That's the star, self-training and responsibility. On the inside, those five functional areas, I'm going to talk about them real quick. Spiritual, emotional, physical, professional, and social. Uh, functional physical fitness. I've got a, a, a second cousin who's an Iraq veteran. He was a vehicle mechanic pre-surge, so early stages of the war. Older guy now. And uh, he posted on his Facebook page that he had tweaked his back because he was squatting like 330 pounds. I'm like, and his name's Nick. Nick, what, why, what, what in your daily life now requires you to have to, have to squat that much weight, right? I mean, wh you're going to hurt yourself. Why are you doing that? What do you like to do? What hobbies do you like to do? What activities do you want to do? Do you want to go, like Nick did last year, go climb Mount Rainier? Well, if you want to do that, now you've got to start thinking about what do I need to do? Maybe squatting 330 pounds is something you need to do to climb Mount Rainier. I don't know. I haven't done it. But you need to be intentional about that. Just going to the gym and slinging iron around is going to get you hurt, and it's not going to further your life goals. you got to watch your nutrition. The testosterone talk yesterday, brilliant, right? Who, has anybody here had their testosterone tested besides the Raider Project folks? I mean, I, I haven't ever even thought about it, right? So that's something that maybe I need to go take a look at. Uh, my wife might say, please don't, but that's... Uh, <laughs> The, the emotional fitness program that we use that I'll talk about here in a minute also talks about gut health. And your, your second brain is your entire colon system. It's lined with brain cells. You may not realize it, but it's constantly sending feedback into your central nervous system, right? And if, if that system is disrupted, whether it's disrupted by diet, by parasite, by allergies, that's going to affect your mood. It's going to affect depression. It's going to, if you have post-traumatic stress, it's going to make it worse. You need to be able, you need to understand and focus on that nutrition. Uh, sleep, boy, that went by really, really quick. You got to be able to sleep better. Uh, Nick's advice on getting there early, getting to bed early. What was it last year? I was like, hey, can we have a conference call or some sometime in the morning? And Nick's like, I go to bed when the sun goes down. I get up when the sun comes up. So no, we can't do it that early. Okay, I understand. That's cool. So, you know, you have, to, you have to figure out what works for you and you have to do that. Uh, I'm one of those people that doesn't require a whole lot of sleep. Sometimes I wish that I did. I think I got one more coming up. Uh, I talked about goals versus objectives a little bit ago. Every year, set an, an objective for yourself that's physically demanding. Maybe it's, I'm going to go climb Mount Rainier. Maybe it's, I'm going to go on a week-long hike in Colorado. Maybe it's, I'm going to do a... 10K run. Right? It depends on what your current level of fitness is, but set an objective that's going to require you to put a plan in place to get there. One of the things that we've done for functional fitness here is an indoor rock climbing program. And uh, I was astounded to find out the veterans that participated in it have increased self-confidence. Their physical fitness levels come up, which would kind of be apparent because now you're out climbing 
but the increased ability to trust is absolutely. Farming does everything for me. Absolute mental bliss. I mean, it's, it's everything wrong disappears as soon as I'm on the wall. Climb on. I had read an article a couple of years ago about rock climbing and its effect on the mind and the body. Thank, Thank you, you Metro Port Rotary. And, and so I'm trying to find a way to get veterans in and participate in this, and let's see if it works, right? And Zach's here, Zach climbs uh, two or three times a week with us. And, and the, the change in his physical and climbing abilities is pretty remarkable over the last year and a half. But I want to talk about that guy that was talking on there. His name's Nate. And when Nate first walked into that climbing gym, he, he almost, he wanted, I could tell he wanted to turn around and run out the door because it's noisy. There's little kids running around. It's, it's a chaotic environment. And, but we saw him. We greeted him. We got him through the safety training. And then he came over to climb. We put him on the rope. And he gets on the rope. By the way, uh, his wife had called me the day before because his stress levels were too much. He, he can't talk on the telephone. So she called and said, is it okay? Can he come? That's why we're here. Please come. So he gets on the rope and he climbs up. It takes him a little while. It's a 5-8 route, which is kind of a beginner on the more harder beginner side. And gets that done, bring him down to the bottom, and I'm belaying him. And as soon as his feet touch the ground, he goes to his knees, collapses, puts his face in his hands. For 30 seconds, he doesn't move. And I'm thinking, what just happened? And after a couple minutes, he stands up, and he looks at me, and he says, that is the first time in the last five years that my mind has been clear. So I couldn't think about anything else but climbing. It was the first time his mind had been clear. And I said, good. I unclipped, and I said, now you belay me. And he looked at me. He's like, I just got here. You want? And I said, you've been through the safety training, right? He said, yeah. And I said, then I trust you. Let's go. And then I climbed, and he belayed me. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago because he said, I couldn't believe that you handed me the rope. By the way, now he coaches other veterans to climb. He comes, he's been very active in bringing other people into the program, and, and he climbs at a different gym here locally because he lives a long ways away. But the important thing about that is it's hard for you to trust somebody else after you leave the military. When's the last time you put your life into somebody else's hands? When's the last time you were responsible for somebody else's life? Right? That climbing environment puts all that stuff in there. So the self-confidence, the trust, the physical fitness, it, it has amazing benefit. Uh, for those of you that are here locally, tomorrow around noon, Bryce and I are gonna go climb at Summit Gym Grapevine, which is just around the corner. Any of you veterans are welcome to join for free. It's all paid for. If you live here, every Tuesday, Thursday night, we're at that gym. And hit me up later and I'll show you the, I'll give you the information so you can come. Functional social fitness. When you were in the military, did somebody sit you down and say, you know, sometime you're going to go to a wine and cheese party, and if you're having this kind of cheese, then you want to have this kind of wine, and this is how you open a wine bottle. Was that your training, right? No, it wasn't. It was how hard, how fast can you drink how much, right? And that's how privates in the military, in the Army anyway, learn how to drink. And when they leave the military, when you leave the military, you may think that's the way people drink. And you may hang out with people that drink that way, which will continue that behavior. That, we got to interrupt that. that. That's part of functional social fitness you've got to relearn. Some of, the, uh, some of the popular groups out on social media are dysfunctional. Misguided children, that kind of stuff. Um, Nick Palmashano is a friend of mine. I tease him because he's got a caffeine brand. It's called uh, Caffeine and Hate, a, a coffee brand called Caffeine and Hate. Well, what kind of message does the veteran community send to everybody else? When you're trying to go get a job and your employer sees your Facebook page that you've been posting on a dysfunctional veteran group, are we helping ourselves by doing that? We gotta change that attitude. We can't let the civilian community believe that that's the way that we are. It, it just, it doesn't work. Uh, you might need a little bit of training on Facebook. Special operations, men and women leave an active duty. They don't have Facebook accounts when they're on active duty right, because of the role that they're in, and they're kind of dicey about it when they get out. But 
there are appropriate ways to engage people on social media and there are inappropriate ways to engage people on social media. Who has that conversation? We need to be having that conversation. One of the things that started in my community is uh, a first Saturday veteran breakfast. How do you get veterans in a local community to get together and how do you find a guide, right? If, a, if you got a buddy that's coming back to your community that you're in the Air Force and they're a Marine, how do you find a Marine that can help your buddy when your buddy comes back? Well, you gotta have a robust network in your community. And towards the end of this, I'm gonna challenge you to be a leader in your community and make this happen. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started a first Saturday veteran breakfast and trophy club. And it was me and Chris, wherever Chris is, and back over at the VA table he was earlier, and maybe one other guy for months. It was just the three of us going and sitting. Well, then I found out that uh, one of our city councilmen is an Air Force veteran. And I sat down with Jim and I said, hey, Jim, we got a veteran problem in our community and, uh, and you're a leader in our community, so what are we gonna do about it? And he said, we don't have a veteran problem in our community. And I said, how many veterans live in our community? And he said, not very many. You know, we only got about 10,000 people that live here. It's not very many veterans. And I said, really? Census says it's 6% of the population. So there's smart rangers and there's strong rangers and I'm somewhere in the middle, but 6% of 10,600 maybe, something like that. So there's 600 veterans. Census also says half a percent of the population are post 9-11 under the age of 35. So that'd be 50. We got 550 veterans that potentially can help 50. We got to get that 10 to 1 ratio mobilized. We got to get it activated. We got to get it activated in Wilmington. We got to get it activated in Kansas City. We got to get it activated in Austin, Los Angeles. Imagine what we can do if we can get that, vet, that network activated. What we did here is, uh, down there in the bottom, this military veteran memorial. It had limped along for a couple of years. The city council was kind of messing around with it, but it wasn't going very far. Well, all of a sudden now we have, with Jim leading, we have 30 plus veterans that are coming to this veteran breakfast every month now. And he came and said, hey, we've got some bricks. Who wants their name on a brick? So now guys are, are I've got half a dozen people that I bought bricks for and relatives of mine that I got their names now on this memorial. And as this thing started to grow, interest started to grow. That's how the veteran I talked about earlier that was gonna be homeless, that's how he got referred to me because people knew that we were doing this, and now there's visibility in the community. Um, Jim came to me and he said, last Memorial Day a year ago, he said, hey, let's do a Memorial Day ceremony at the flagpole. I said, that's a great idea, but we have a little historic cemetery in town, it's called Medlin Cemetery, it's like 150 years old. I said, do we by chance have any veterans in our cemetery? And he said, I don't know, I'll go find out. He came back to me, he said, 52, 52 veterans buried in that cemetery. Sounds like we need to move the Memorial Day ceremony to the cemetery. So he put out word on the town Facebook page that we're going to do it. Now there's like 50 people from the town that come out to clean up the cemetery. Somebody heard what we were doing. A family member of somebody interred there made a $5,000 donation to the cemetery to spruce things up before the... I mean, all of this stuff is happening because a couple of veterans said, we need to get our veteran community mobilized, right? That's what we have to do. We have to continue to be leaders when we leave the military. It, you are responsible for this. Functional professional fitness. I'm going to move through this stuff pretty fast because I want to talk about the emotional fitness part before my time runs out. Functional professional fitness. Um, you, you probably don't know or didn't know when you left active duty that there are clubs like Rotary Clubs all over the, all over the area. Here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, there's nearly 100 Rotary Clubs. They're all little local ones. Some meet for lunch, some meet for dinner, some meet for breakfast, some go to a bar for beers. But it's for people in the community that strongly believe in service. The motto of Rotary is service above self. I've been a Rotarian for about 15 years. It's a great group of people. Go find that group. You don't have to belong to go visit. You can go have breakfast with your local Rotary Club just to check them out. Uh, our club's got about 35 members and we've got uh, six military veterans. So it's, when you start looking at the percents, it mirrors or maybe is a little higher than the civilian population because because veterans tend to, I think, kind of move towards that community service part. We've, that the Rotary Clubs do a lot of cool things. They fund our veteran climbing program because they do a big fundraiser every year. They had money left over, and they said, does anybody have a pet project they'd like to fund? I'm like, I do. Let me give you a little plan. Everybody voted. We were the number one program for three years in a row. They've, they've funded it. We're getting ready to go into the fourth year. Hopefully, they'll renew it. I think they will. 
but they fund that. When a veteran comes three times and registers with the Gallant Fuse system, they get a free pair of climate shoes and a harness because we want them to keep coming back, right? And not use the crappy, stinky rental stuff that the, the gym has for them to use. Um, Chamber of Commerce. Chambers of Commerce have socials once a month. A lot of them have free coffees once a month. You don't have to belong to the South Lake Chamber of Commerce here to go to one of their socials. It might cost you 35 bucks to go, but guess what? You're gonna meet business owners, you're gonna meet vice presidents of sales, you're gonna be able to walk around and rub elbows with people that you're just not gonna be able to bump into on the street. Building that network out is an amazingly important part of professional fitness. Um, that network, I already talked about that. Uh, money, professional fitness is managing your money. You get a, an enlistment bonus when you're in the military, what do you do? Buy an F-350, uh, four-wheel drive, super jack pickup truck, right? That costs $65,000 and, and then a year later you hurt your knee and now you're out and you got a $700 a month truck payment and you got no money. I have a veteran that we've worked with that's been through that. And when you tell that guy, you got to go take the truck back to the dealership and walk away from the loan and start your financial life over again, that's a hard thing to do. But you got to, you have to understand and manage that part. So it's a very important part of that Gallant Few Star. You know what? A resume is worth about what it shows right there. You should just crumple it up and throw it away because resumes don't get you hired. A perfect resume is not going to get you a job. Otherwise, well, I've written lots of perfect resumes. I'd, I'd be like Bill Gates now, right? Resumes don't get you hired. Networks get you hired. People you know get you hired. I was talking with somebody, I think it was last night, about how do you, how do you find somebody when, man, it's so frustrating, I upload my resume, I didn't even get a call back for the interview, and I know I was clearly qualified for the job. Well, did you find a veteran that works there? Did you go to LinkedIn and search veteran and that company name and a zip code? Because if you find a veteran on the inside of that organization and you send them a message and say, hey, I'm a veteran, I think I'm qualified for this position, can I pick your brain? They might get a bonus for bringing somebody to work at the company. And so they're like, hey, yeah, I, this is easy for me. Or they might be, hey, this is somebody like me that I'd really like to have work here. They'll help to pull you into the organization. That's part of what that professional network is all about and what it needs to do. I've got one. I've got a special purpose! Do you do? Yeah, the best purpose! It's great! It's unbelievable! And I was afraid to tell you about it. Your mother's going to want me! When we talk about functional spiritual fitness, it's not what creed, what belief. It's do you have a purpose, right? Do you have a mission in life? Because if you don't have purpose, then you don't have hope. And if you don't have hope, you don't have a reason to live. You have, you, go back to you are responsible, you have to find that purpose. Nobody's gonna go to you and say, here's your purpose. I, I got your purpose for you, here it is. You have to figure out what that is. If, uh, I, I worked with a veteran last year that said, if only I could start, I wanna start a dog program for veterans, but I don't have any money, I don't have a 501c3, you know, I, but, but this is my passion, I really wanna do it. I said, have you gone to your local animal shelter and volunteered? No, you mean I can do that? Yeah, you can do that. Go volunteer at your local animal shelter and say, I want to help with your dog program. You might end up working there. You might make a friend with their board chair who might say, you have a great idea, let's fund your program. But, but you, if that's your mission, if that's your purpose, then go find a way to participate in it. If you're feeling sorry for yourself, the best way to get through that is by helping somebody or something that's in a worse situation than you. If you go to a kill shelter and you know that that dog you're looking at is gonna be put down unless it gets adopted and you can teach that dog to sit, that dog's got a better chance of getting adopted, right? So look for ways that you can create purpose in your life. Okay, functional emotional fitness. This is kind of the meat of what I wanna talk about. What questions do you ask yourself? What questions do you ask yourself? Is there, I said earlier, there is no failure, right? There's only information. But think about a goal in your life that you have been trying to accomplish and you're not there yet. Anybody have one of those? Nobody has one of those? Everybody's accomplished all their objectives. Why are you here? 
Somebody, somebody give me an example. What, what's a goal that you're trying, an objective that you're trying to accomplish, you're not there yet? Anybody? Writing a book. Writing a book. Okay. Why isn't it done yet? What question goes through your head when you say, my book's not done yet? What do you ask yourself? Um, why don't I take the time I have to devote to it? Okay, so why don't I take the time that I have available to devote to that book? Can you answer that question with because? I'm right? Can you, can you answer that question starting with the word because? Yeah. Then what you've done, see if I have these in the right sequence and it works. What you have done is, survey says, you've created an excuse. Yeah. If you can answer that question with because, why can't I lose weight? Well, it's because, you know, whatever. It's because I work 12 hours a day, and when I go home at night, I got to eat, and then I go to bed, and that's, you know, I, I don't have time to work out. It gives you permission to continue the behavior that doesn't allow you to make your objective. If you change those questions to uh, a positive and empowered form, then you're going to be able to uh, start your mind working and thinking on solutions to that. So if you ask yourself, what do I need to do to create time to write my book? Now your mind starts going, well, you know, you got two minutes on Friday morning. And, you know, or it might say when you're driving to work, use an audio recorder and start putting an outline together. It just, ideas are going to start coming, right? And we talked about this at the Raider Project, Rewa Ranch Retreat last October. And one of the veterans that was there, a special operations veteran, um, senior enlisted, going through some pretty difficult times in his life and removed from his kids, lost custody of his kids, not only lost custody of his kids, but lost visitation with his kids, lost supervised visitation. And he was poisoning himself. Why, can't, why am I not good enough to see my kids? Why can't I get visitation with my kids? Why can't I, why can't I, why can't I? And all of the answers are coming back because, well, because you had a combat experience. Well, because this happened, because that happened. It was giving him permission to continue the behavior that kept him there. As soon as he started the, the thought process of what do I need to do to be able to see my kids, now things changed. Within a month, his wife had lifted the restriction. He got unsupervised visitation with his kids. I mean, it is absolutely amazing on both sides how you can poison your mind and how you can enrich your mind just by the question that you ask yourself. Um, the key is in your subconscious. So how many people uh, met somebody last night and then you saw them this morning and you're like, uh, hi, bud, because you forgot what their name was. Then a week later, you're going to be driving to work or you're going to be doing something else. You're going to go, Jack, that was Jack. Why, why God, it took a week for me to remember Jack's name? Why is that? Well, it's because your subconscious is going to continue working on any question that you give it until it comes up with an answer. You may not realize it, but it's going to do that. If you have an unsurmountable issue in your life that you're trying to figure out, if you have a positive, empowering question that you're running through your mind, you're writing it down on a note card, you're looking at it in the morning, you're looking at it at night, your subconscious is going to look for a solution to that. And, and eventually one's going to come up if you're asking the right question about it. If you're asking a question that starts with because, you're giving yourself an excuse to continue the behavior. So here's your subconscious. Right, the underwater part, that's your subconscious. The above water part, that's your conscious mind. You have all of this stuff going on in your subconscious mind. You're asking yourself questions every day. When you, when you got up this morning, you said, what time do I need to leave to get here on time? What do I want to wear today? What, what do I want to have for breakfast? Do I want to have one of those bagels? Or, you've got all these questions that are running through your mind and you don't even realize that you're doing it. You can't function unless that happens. You have to create that picture. Asking that, power, that empowering question creates that picture. Your subconscious mind works at a rate that's about four times faster than your conscious mind. So while I'm up here talking, my subconscious mind is going, I'm already like four slides ahead of where I'm going to be because your mind, your subconscious mind works faster. You got to put that power to work for you and not against you. Make it give you solutions, not excuses. Next slide, please. If I were to ask you, where'd you go on vacation last year? What's the process go? What do you, you repeat in your mind, you say, where did I go on vacation? Then you get an image of an elephant on a beach, and then you can say to me, I, I went to this beach and there was an elephant rolling in the sand, right? If you don't go through that process, you can't do it. If you don't go through that process with your objectives, 
you're not going to be able to achieve your objective unless you just have blind luck. Next one, please. How do you activate that subconscious mind? Next. That gets into the empowering questions. Next, please. You got to interrupt, restructure, and reprogram that thought. I'm going to give you an example of that. So I mentioned earlier I've got a prosthetic hip. I can't go out and run. I love to run. When I was in the military, I was a fast runner, loved distance running. One of those weird people that loves to run, right? When I told Nick we got this program called Run, Ranger, Run, he's like, can we have something like Walk, Marine, Walk? Because we don't like to run, right? <laughs> it, it, well, I love to run, but I can't. So I got to figure out another way that I can get my cardio and my exercise because I enjoy having a couple of beers with dinner at night and I would weigh way more than I do if I wasn't biking. So I set a goal for myself. When I get an objective, excuse me, when I get on a bike, I want to maintain, this is when I first started two years ago, I want to maintain a 15 mile an hour pace. No matter how far I go, minimum 15 mile an hour pace. And last October at the Raywall Ranch, I spent a couple of days talking with these Marine Corps veterans about this concept of functional emotional fitness and the questions you ask yourself. The next day after I travel back home, I get on my bike in the morning, I go out, I'm gonna do a 20 mile bike ride. I'm three miles in and my earbuds say, your average pace is 14.2 miles an hour. What do you think is the first question went through my head? Why can't I maintain a 15 mile an hour pace, right? I just spent two days training these guys on not using questions that, start, that you can answer with because. And now my mind is saying, well, it's because you were in Colorado. You're probably dehydrated. You just got off a plane last night. You know, you're probably a little tired. So it's okay to not meet your objective. And as soon as I recognized I was doing that, I interrupted it. I restructured it into a different format. And that format was, what do I need to do to maintain a 15 mile an hour pace? Now my mind is going, watch the gear selection, work the hills, make sure you're hydrated. Now all these, it's like a bucket got dumped on my head of ideas to meet my objective. I finished that ride 20 miles, uh, about 16.2. It's the fastest that I had ever gone that distance before. Now I've, now I've worked my way above that. Um, but that's the power of that question. And it can work in a very, very simple manner. But you've got to use it. And you have to interrupt yourself when you start to go negative. Um, Garrett, yesterday, that uh, comment there at the bottom I captured, think how you want your story to end. And remember, you write your own story. If you think about that picture of the elephant on the beach, you can create what your objective is. You create that in your head. And then you start asking yourself, how do I achieve the objectives that I want to achieve? And you can be very specific in that. And uh, that's the power of the question. The Burris functional emotional fitness training that we do, uh, I've got a number of veterans that I've taken through it. And those benchmarks up on the side, we do surveys before we start and after we're done and then periodically throughout. And emotional stability is up almost 50%. Behavior control is up 30%. Relationship satisfaction up 25%. That's, that's averages across the board. Um, it can be life-changing stuff. It's free for any veteran. You want to be, you want to go through the coaching, I will take you through the coaching. It's online, it's on the phone, it takes two hours, two days in a row. It's a four-hour process, and then I follow up with you once a week for about 30 minutes for a month until you start to get these things sunk into your head. We're, our ultimate goal with Gallant Few is to get a bunch of you trained to be coaches like me. Now, uh, Dr. Burris, the Burris Institute in California, loves what we do so much, he's changed his terminology from emotional wellness to emotional fitness, and he has made me a master Burris coach, and he's allowing me to certify other coaches at no cost. He, he allows me to do the training to veterans at no cost. He provides the web platform, all of that stuff is out there. So if you want to do it, see me, and, uh, and we'll get you connected into it. Now you can go to the next one. Well, on the back side of my business card, and I've got a stack of them over here by the Darby Project Gallant Few table, the back side of my business card has the Spartan Pledge. And going back to the one-on-one -on -one relationship, the connection that you need to make, I encourage you, reach out to a battle buddy, a ranger buddy, a swim mate, a shipmate, whatever you call that person that you know and trust, that you had their back and they had yours, call them up and take this pledge. Because veteran suicide is a recurring problem. When I said earlier 20 veterans a day take their own life, every one of you out here is at risk for that. You are at risk for becoming that statistic. As you get older and you cross the 50 mark, your 
your risk factor increases, right? We have to stop that. We have to interrupt it and we have to reprogram it. And this is a way that you do that. You reach out to your buddy and you say, I promise I will not take my life by my own hand until I call you first to tell you goodbye, tell you love you, whatever it is. And I'm going to make it a mission to find a mission, find a purpose to help my warfighter family. I've had veterans that have taken that pledge and then they were, they were there. They're going to take their own life. They pick up the phone, they call their battle buddy, say goodbye. And their battle buddy says, I love you. I need you. Does that change the factor there? This happened with my best friend in the world, a guy named Bill, who was instrumental in starting Gallant Few. He was one of my initial board members. He slid a $100 bill across the table at me uh, at dinner one night and said, you got a great idea. Here's your first donation. Get going. So it was 2009. And he went through a divorce. Terrible, terrible. All divorces are bad. This one was bad times 100. And alienated from his family, feeling sorry for himself. Um, he, he actually, he was a Gallant Few board member, and he was checked out. He wasn't participating in calls. And I asked the board chair, I said, would you call Bill, because we're such close friends. If he doesn't have time for this, I'm okay with that, but we need to put somebody else on the board. So the board chair actually called. It's not a good talk unless I crack up once. Board chair called him and said, hey, if you don't have time for this, we're cool. And Bill said, you're right, I don't have time for this. <clears throat> so he stepped off the board. About a month later, a mutual friend called and said, I'm really worried about Bill. Uh, when's the last time you talked to him? And I said, he's been checked out for six months. I haven't talked to him in a long time. He had called him. If I hadn't called him, he might not have lived through that night. And when he got on the phone, I could hear the heaviness in his voice. And I had, thank God, I'd been through the um, assist training that Team Rubicon had put on here. So now I'm a more familiar with the suicide prevention stuff. And I immediately said that they would say, have you made a plan to kill yourself? I said, have you thought about hurting yourself? 30 seconds, he didn't say anything. Boy, that told me everything I needed to know. And, uh, and so I said, do you know how much I love you? Do you know how much I need you in my life? You've got to be here. What you're going through right now, it's going to get better. You don't see it right now. Your nose is so close to that brick wall, you can't tell. But it's going to get better. And, uh, and I said, I want you to take this pledge with me. And I made him take the pledge with me. And then we've got, <clears throat> I should have brought one with me, but we've got some Spartan Pledge dog tags. They're like a challenge coin. They're really heavy. And I don't know if anybody in here has one. Probably not. Um, we, I've got more coming, so we'll be able to make them available again. But they come in numbered pairs. And they both have the same number on it. So I, I sent him one in the mail, and I kept the other one. And, uh, and through this process, he survived that night. I mean, his, he's still going through some, some things, but it's way better than it was. And uh, a couple of weeks later, so I started calling him up every couple of days. Hey, how you doing? Let's check in. Uh, just to remind him that he is important to me. And, and I couldn't believe that I had let him slip that far because he was so close to me. And, uh, and, and I said, I got my coin sitting right here in front of me on the desk. And he said, I've got mine on a chain around my neck. I mean, this, like, think of a challenge coin, right? Big, thick, heavy metal thing on a, on a chain around his neck. And I said, dang, that's, that's heavy to wear around your neck. And he said, yeah, I know, because every time I move, it thumps me in the chest bone and it reminds me. That's what we've got to do for each other, right? If you don't feel like you're in danger of suicide, your best friend might be. You need to reach out. You need to take that Spartan pledge. You need to understand. The psychologist will say suicide pacts don't work. That's because when you make a promise to a psychologist, it doesn't mean anything. Right? But when you make a promise to one of us, that means something. Even if you just call to say goodbye. But that opening that phone line makes all the difference in the world. Uh, next, please. Remember that purpose equals hope. And if you don't have purpose, you don't have hope. Next. 
I'm going to challenge each of you to be a leader in your community. Your community might be your veteran community. It might be your work community. It might be your geographical hometown. Whatever your community is, you have got to go out and get connected and find other veterans and get them connected. We have to do it because the system is failing us. The system is not going to fix itself. It doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter who's in charge of the VA. The system's always going to be broken. The only way that we can fix it is by taking charge of it ourselves, and we can do that. And Gallant Few, Raider Project, Darby Project, Wings Level, we're positioned to help you be successful at doing that. Shameless plug, in July I've got a book coming out that talks about all the things that I just talked about. Uh, my hope and dream is that we can influence policy through the White House to the VA. If we can get the VA to say, you know what, we've got 10 million veterans across the country that could mentor 500,000 young veterans across the country, let's make it happen. Let's figure, out, let's figure out how to get them connected. If the VA took leadership on that, we could change the face of transition in a very short period of time. Um, I'm not optimistic that that's going to happen. So we've got to do it community by community. Next slide, please. My contact information, my mobile phone number. Anybody can reach out to me at any time. On the Gallant Few webpage, top right corner, there's a contact us. My mobile phone and my email are right there. Thank you for your time. I look forward to talking to anybody when we do the breakout session. So thank you. <laughs>